There's a wonderful Zen saying. I just love it. Um, teachers would be talking about their students, and they would say he or she. Well, they'd say, well, you know, he's ahead of the ass, but he's behind the horse. He's ahead of the ass, but, or she's ahead of the ass, but she's behind the horse. Now, that's a wonderful saying. You're waiting for me to explain it. You are? In a, in a way, the, the description, like a teacher talking about a student saying, you know, she's, she's ahead of the ass, but behind the horse, that actually would be, the teacher would be saying that they're pretty developed, right? I mean, at least they're in front of the, right there, they're in front of the ass. So they, they are really somewhat developed. Someone who is, uh, you know, the horse might represent really being much further along in your practice. So that would be like they've really made quite a bit of progress in, in their practice uh, uh, of the Dharma. To be um, in front of the ass is very good. And so I really sometimes ask myself, you know, I wonder, well, am I... <laughs> As my, as my practice led me to at least be in front of the ass, it, even though I'm still behind the horse. So, um, the, um, today I went to Gelson's uh, and spent $146, which is a lot of money for me. Well, it's a lot of money for everybody, isn't it? And Gelson's is quite expensive, but I'm, I'm uh, attached to Gelson's. <clears throat> I like Gelson's a lot. And, um, well, what is it, Whole Paycheck? Yeah. That one's good, too. I go to Whole Foods, too. But anyway, so, so the reason I spent that much money at Gelson's, as some of you know, but if you were here, those of you who've been listening to my uh, few Dharma talks, uh, I, haven't, I haven't been there in three weeks. So you see, that's why, so that's why I spent that much money, because I've, and there's not been any, this, the kitchen has been bare. I mean, I was desperate last night. What did I have? I was so desperate last night, I ended up, Oh, I know, I made some popcorn. Well, well that wasn't desperate. That was good. I made some popcorn with, uh, with uh, melted butter, but I can't really tell Mary that because she's very focused on my diabetes. Oh, well, and the stroke, too, you know, so I mean, I mean I, it's a double trouble for me. So, <clears throat> so I spent $146, uh, and, uh, and that's because I haven't been there in three weeks. And, you know, so as I said, the cupboard was, I mean, it was desperate. I had some raisins and some popcorn. So anyway, uh, <laughs> the reason why I haven't been there in three weeks was because I got really pissed off at Gelson's. I, got, I went three weeks ago. So I'm driving away from Gelson's, and I said, I will never darken their doors again. I will never go back, right, as I'm driving. <laughs> why are you laughing, Sam? I was convinced I would never go back ever again because they, uh, I was standing at a counter for 15 minutes and they ignored me. Well, I just was <laughs> furious. And so that led me to this Dharma talk about see, being seen, you know, so we were talking about intimacy a few weeks ago. So I've been on this bit for a while. <clears throat> how we see each other and we don't see each other and what that means. And you're, some of you remember where I was talking about the Joy Luck Club, that wonderful movie where the mother looks at her daughter and says, I see you, which is very touching. <clears throat> so anyway, it, it, it occurred to me, you know, so I, I thought, so there you go. The guy, the guy who said, I will never go back there again, just was there this morning having buying groceries. And I thought, well, those are not the same people, are they, right? There's one person who says he's never going to go again, and then this other person. And of course, that is, I think, the story of our lives, right? We're never the same person from day to day to day, or even from minute to minute to minute. So we say this, and I'm not going to do this, and then we do it. So, uh, so I've been very focused on and interested in and that's what I want to just talk to you all a little bit about today. Um, it's very clear that I get very triggered. So I, so I got home with all my glasses, uh, glasses or groceries, and um, three or four bags were just full of like lots of goodies. And so then I get on the elevator and I 
put my shirt on and my trousers on and I'm on the way to get here. And so the my next door neighbor, who's a wonderful little man, Japanese, thickest accent you have ever heard in your life. Just a wonderful. So I'm standing, we're standing in the elevator. So this is like the, uh, let's just say, so he's, he's lived there about 14 years as I have. So, so we're standing in the elevator and I pushed the down. And he looks at me and I would not try to imitate his accent because it would not be, just so be I'm not good at that stuff. I had a, a client who I told him a couple of weeks ago if he ever imitated me, I would kill him because he's very good. <laughs> I said, if I ever hear you trying to imitate me in my <laughs> accent, I said, you will be dead. So anyway, so we're getting on the elevator and so there is a, a Maury, uh, he's a wonderful person. So he looks at me and he says, oh, you look so nice. Where are you going? <laughs> so I said, Maury, I'm going the same place I've gone for the past 14 years at 3 p.m. every single day. I said, I lead a meditation group. So he said, <laughs> I felt not seen. <laughs> now, it wasn't that bad, you know, so because I mean, but you know, had it, you know, at another day, it could have been that bad, but I mean, I did it really with some humor. And so he said, oh, I can't remember. But it is true that he's, we've done this same thing for 14 years. And he's always says every single time, oh, you look so nice. <laughs> you look so nice. Where are you going? And I'm thinking, how much? You know, so <clears throat> this really bothers me. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I got, you know, I, mean, he's, I, I, I care for him and he's very sweet. And I, and I really covered my ass very quickly. Now, <laughs> But in that moment, I was really not in front of the ass. Uh, in front, I mean, I was, you know, the the horse. I was behind the ass, so I covered it. So it was fine. But and, and so he was, he smiled. But the truth is, I'm very fascinated with that feeling in us of anger that comes up when we're not seen. It, it's just amazing to me. I mean, it's like, uh, and so I will. I, many times, you know, with uh, sitting with clients, you know, I've gone into this, you know, I'll give them this psychological explanation. Well, you know, your mother didn't see you when you were little. You know, your daddy didn't see you when you were little. Or your mom and your dad didn't see you when you were little. You weren't nurtured as a child. This is the, the old psychological, I shouldn't put it down to you, and it's, I don't mean to put it down. God knows I shouldn't put it down. But, uh, <clears throat> but it is really true that we, we talk about the, uh, kind of a woundedness that happens in, in humans, all humans, that there's this kind of like, to the degree that we weren't seen or nurtured when we were little, it creates this hunger in us, a hunger to be seen and, uh, uh, by the outside, and that we, it's, it, it seems to be universal. Um, well, I, I like to say it's universal because it excuses my behavior, right? <clears throat> and then the other thing that I, want, I would just say to add to that is that um, I guess I guess I would say that I'm grateful for that experience. Um, you know, even you know, like I, if I, I can sort of march proudly along and say, "Well, I'll never go back to that store again as long as I live," but but the truth is, you know, it it reminds me of of what this that there is this sense of self inside that needs a reflection. It needs to be seen. It needs to be reflected, and uh, <clears throat> and um, I think, um, like I say, there are people who. Um, well, I don't want to go there. There are many different ways that the injury uh, appears. And um, so, now, so this is, so that we have to, so now we have to, we're going to make a little transition here. Um, mm, I wonder, I guess we can't make that much of a transition. So, uh, I read this to you all uh, in a Dharma talk about four weeks ago. So I'm going to read it again, probably.
So, so in a way, I would say the limit of psychology, and I'll say this kind of, um, I mean, it's, first of all, it's rather pompous to say the limit of psychology. Most of you know that I love psychology. I, uh, I love it tremendously. But um, <clears throat> it is true that the psychology traces us back to our childhood invariably, and then, then it sees our problem of uh, narcissism as something where we were not reflected when we were little, right? We were not reflected as children, and therefore we, we uh, end up with a kind of a, this hunger and, and, and this narcissism. You all know the story of narcissists. He looked in the lake, and he saw his own reflection, and he fell in love with it, right? That's the, the legend of narcissists. So um, narcissism is, is this... Um, <clears throat> Well, it's, it is this, uh, you almost say that it's like the, 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 a broken mirror or the lake. It's like a person who no longer has, uh, the, the lake is no longer there. So they're looking for their reflection in others. I'm looking for my reflection in Teresa or in Travis. Uh, that would be uh, the uh, narcissistic wound. We um, are always looking for some reflection of ourselves in the other person. So when Maury said, well, you look really nice today, where are you going? <laughs> Something in me was not felt not seen, right? I mean, because the meditation teacher who does this, who's done this for 20 blasted years, right? <laughs> and has put a shirt, nice shirt on every Sunday or something, you know? So that part, some part of me, you know, was not seen. Which is so fascinating, you know. It's very sad that that would be a Buddhist teacher, <laughs> which doesn't speak very well for my background or, or for my um, for my the depth of my um, practice. But it's, it was it's fascinating to see how quickly the, it, it triggered, and then also, as I say, I mean, it's also uh, rather um, reassuring for me that I don't get terribly confused in it. Right, I recognize it pretty quickly. Oh. Oh, there it is again. That sense of self that needs to be reflected. It again, there it is. So, um, so I go. So I wanted to say again. So, uh, the well, I'll just add this little piece since I am exposing my ass. <laughs> so I had uh, analysis with a, with a brilliant and like one of the truly great analysts of the world. It's world famous. Um, it, it has been said that he was the best dream uh, analysis, a, analysis or analyzer, I guess, uh, in the world. Um, and he was the head of the Jungian Institute in New York. And with my work with him, at some point, um, through uh, quite a long period of time, I was in my late 40s, when the thought occurred to me, oh my God, I'm narcissistic. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. I mean, really, I'm I mean, it was shocking, right? It was shocking. Oh my God. There's something about me that is really narcissistic. Now, that to me was like a that was really almost like an insight. It, it's almost like in meditation, you know, we talk about Vipassana insight. I mean, this was not like I thought, oh my God, I'm, this is the end of the world, or I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to. I thought, oh my God, who knew? You know, so I mean, I've been studying it for years. I've been studying narcissism. I mean, this need to be reflected. I've been studying it for years. And then suddenly I thought, oh. <laughs> so, so this is not like, so for me, it's not, you know, it's not like. Uh, news are shocking when I suddenly find myself angry with you when you don't see me because I suddenly say, "Oh, that's the narcissism." There it is. It came again. There it is. You know. And I would suggest to you that if you don't have narcissism, if anyone in this room is not narcissistic, you're really wounded. <laughs> I mean, because because wounded. I mean, narcissism is like the is like the wound of of our age. You know? And so, if someone who is not in cont in contact or in touch with that profound narcissism, that's 
that's really being behind the ass. I mean, that means you're, I mean, the horse ain't even near in front of you, right? Because narcissism is, and this was the little thing I was going to say, uh, Houston Smith is one of the great, 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 he wrote The Religions of Man. It's a wonderful book. He said that Buddhism is uh, the cure for universal narcissism. It's an amazing sentence. So that's sort, of like, that's sort of like in the front of his book, he says Buddhism is the cure for universal narcissism. Well, so number one, he suge- you know, like we would suggest that narcissism is universal. I think that w- I would say that it's u- universal. I'm not, I'm not, I could not go as far as to say that Buddhism is the cure of it. I, I, I wish it were the cure of it. I think most of us who look around in the world would say, well, <laughs> Not likely. It isn't exactly, it doesn't look like there's this, this cure, right, that has swept over mankind, do you think? Is, can we see that, you know, that there's something that's swept over all of us and, there, you know, that we've uh, kind of been relieved of this need to be seen? So, um, but I would, so, so I do think that that's a rather grandiose statement, and, and, and sadly, uh, it isn't where we are in, in our evolution the evolution of our species is actually, I would say, you know, that we are at the narcissistic stage as a species, as a species. Uh, and, you know, so then when you say at, a, at the narcissistic stage of, as a species, I don't know that that's not much more than three years old. But I guess the point that I wanted to make is that Certainly, even though this guy came around 2,500 years ago, or now, you know, we've been saying that for the past 100 years. It's now 2,600 years. It's time for us to, you know, everyone says 2,500 years. Well, you know, it's now probably 2,600, but we haven't switched much. So anyway, so this guy said, I'm going to say he says these two, these, these, these astoundingly profound things that we've still not really been able to process. We've only had 2,600 years at it, and we've not processed it year yet. And, uh, and I don't think we're even close to processing it. And uh, I have said, as some of you have heard, I've said this many times, I think that you know, we're in this kind of amazing race to see if we can last long enough before we can grow up. You know, will we destroy ourselves as a species, or this planet Earth either, Will, will we destroy ourselves before we have time to grow up and to grow out of narcissism? And would anyone like to? <laughs> That's a crapshoot, isn't it? Yeah. It's a crapshoot because it could well be that we're talking about like I mean, if it's if 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 someone has came and gave us the diagnosis of our problem two thousand six hundred years ago, and we're still pretty much absolutely at the same place. Which uh, I will, I'll just mention Paris in just a minute, the, or Belgium, or everything that happened last week. So what did he say? So that's what I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about. So he said that. Um, and so this is not what he said, by the way. I'm just going to. I'm just going to put it in my own words. We, um, we have this tendency that the, the, the human mind reifies uh, everything. Yeah. The old Sean teachers say that we make a nest out of everything. But what, so what does reify mean? Reify means we make things concrete. That are, so like we take a symbol and we we make it into something concrete. Uh, I was at a seminar about 20 years ago, and I'll never forget this. It's very sweet, and I can tell this now because it's so long ago. But So I was at this seminar where we're talking about the inner child. Right? We're talking about the child that lives within, right? The inner child. That was the big thing. Bradshaw was a big thing about 20 years ago. When you were a therapist, you always talked about everybody's inner child. I mean, I did. I, I love to do that. So... Uh, 
I had a friend of mine who was there with me, and well, I mean, just attending the same seminar, and we were having coffee, uh, a break, and so she, she said, listen, she said, I want to ask you a question. And I said, well, well, what is it? She said, this business about this inner child, I said, yes. She said, well, they're not saying there's really an inner, there's a child inside, are they? <laughs> Yeah. So, this was called this would be called concrete thinking, right? In other words, she, it, she couldn't get the symbol, right? I mean, the, the idea of a symbol that's inside, right? It's like this inner child. So she was concretizing it, so that she was uh, imagining, trying to picture like a little child that's you know that's standing somewhere inside your chest or in your head. So I said, no, no, no. I said, I think it's actually the it, the word inner child is supposed to be a symbol. So, uh, so Jung says that, so what is a symbol? A symbol is something that is, uh, that um, will represent something uh, that is almost beyond, uh, we can't really identify it exactly. Uh, 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 you could say this is a symbol. This could be a symbol for something. And uh, uh, recently someone during our fundraiser, got very upset with us. I mean, really upset with us because we had made this, you know, the, the the gauge with the, you know, with the Buddha with the money going up. Well, we got a letter. Oh my God! I mean, they were just. I would, I would not, I would not, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say furious. Because it's because. It, it seems so uh, that we were being uh, blasphemous, right? And I mean, I understand, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not criticizing that. So that was like the symbol had become in this person so concrete in their mind, right? That they could not really, the idea of, you know, having a, a thermometer was really quite, the word that they used was, was crass. A cross is a symbol, right? A Christian cross is a symbol. What is well, how do you how do you really put into words what that is, what that means? Right? And um, so, the um, um, Jung said, part of the symbol is in the unconscious. That's that's why we can't ever really, you know, it represents something so profound in the unconscious. Right? I mean, we consciously will know, you know, that what the symbol is on some level, but it also has incredible meaning. The American flag, someone burns the American flag. Some people are just furious about that. You know, someone else might not be furious. But it's what, the cl what that flag symbolizes. Yeah? So, um, we know the, the, uh, the, uh, the cartoon of, uh, of uh, Mohammed in Paris, right? We know what that caused, right? It, it caused the, the, these people to. Uh, right. That's an example of taking a symbol and reifying it. Okay, that's what that means. It takes the symbol and we've reified it into something concrete. And then, you know, it's like heaven forbid that you would anyway, in any way, uh, disparage it or put it down, because what you are doing in a way is you're disparaging that. You know, the person has so identified with the symbol that they are, uh, you know, they could want to destroy you for doing that. So the greatest symbol, the symbol that um, we still have not been able to really quite uh, grasp, or well, you can't grasp the symbol. But so this is back to the what the Buddha taught, and. Um, For whatever reason, and there are many, many, many different explanations for why we ended up doing this, but we reify objects outside. That's Allison. We reify objects, you know, so that like even a car can become a symbol or anything outside, right? And we desire that object, and we reify this something inside called a self. We reify a self, you know. There's, there's this, the self is actually the ultimate symbol, in fact, according to the Buddha. 
we reify this self and then we you know, and then we become attached to it okay so we become attached to this me this and it's actually nothing but a symbol it's a self you know what is a self so we 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 are we we are attached to it and then we will do anything in the world to protect it to some extent what you can see about you know like the in, in paris the uh, the terrorists are attacking something that they think is attacking them that's trying to destroy them their senses it's actually coming from that reified self inside that's what it is so here's the problem and so this is the real problem of like uh again back to uh so uh you know so maury looks at me and says well you look very nice where are you going right so i think oh, okay. <laughs> the buddha suggests that there is no there is the self is transparent it's not solid there's no solid self inside Right? There's no real me. There's no real Travis. It's a, an accumulation of memories and desire. Now, let's just pretend that. So he says that that's what you know. What this is all. Let's pretend that he's correct. That you're sitting there, attached to a self that doesn't exist. <laughs> think about that. Just think that you're sitting there, attached to a self that does not exist. Is that not going to make you feel a little nervous and anxious? <laughs> right? Just think about it. You know, this thing, of the, you know, people are talking about existential angst. The absence of a solid self, right, if that's reality, which the Buddha said, he says there is no you inside. And so then if, if you're not really connected to that, you're going to be relentlessly defended against experiencing it and you're going to be doing you know you and i we're going to be religiously and relentlessly uh, attempting to solidify that sense to protect it protect that sense of me over and over and over and so the um you know so this is kind of like a, a kind of a backdoor way of talking about really the the the, the profoundest teaching of of, of the buddha uh, that because we can't bear our own emptiness, because we can't bear it, because we can't bear the truth of impermanence, that nothing lasts, nothing in this side, nothing lasts. Because we can't bear it, we are relentlessly doing everything in the world to pretend it's not true, and then we're going to suffer. We have to suffer. There's no way not to suffer. And that's really simply what, I mean, in simple terms, that's what he said. Because you can't bear your own transparency or emptiness. Number one, you're going to project, well, Victor is not transparent, right? No one thinks that this is true. So, that, so you project onto this solidity, right? And then, of course, of course, like, like I'll be lasting forever, right? Because so in case I die, then you're going to be very disappointed, right? But you see, I mean, so so we project it on the object. The other person has got to be real too, right? So you have you can't die, right? You mustn't die, because that would that you know that means that you're impermanent. That you're impermanent. So just think about it. If we're living in a world where nothing is permanent, nothing lasts. And we are absolutely relentlessly clinging to the fantasy that things last. I mean, oh, what? A <laughs> so, you know, um, that means as long as I am going to be uh, denying this reality, that means I'm going to go to Gelson's and when they don't see me, I'm going to get very angry. I'm never going to go back there again. You know, so see, I can't even maintain that self long enough to even not, go, you, know, I'm, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was so sure that I'm not going to go back there ever again. Those people, they ignored me. And so, you know, three weeks later, I'm, I'm driving down <laughs> towards PCH. I said, oh, God, I can't wait to get back there and get those things I want. Of this. So that, you know, so, so that, that's living proof that that self can't even last three weeks, let alone, you know, two minutes. 
So our uh, woundedness of, of, of uh, narcissism uh, actually ultimately, I would say, and the, I think the, the Buddha would say, the actual wound is that something in you knows that you're not real. Something in you knows you're not really real, and it's just unbearable. So we'll do just about everything. We, we'll get so we'll you know like you know it's like I, I mean people used to say in, 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 when I lived in New York that I had more friends than anybody they had, they'd ever known. I, I did. I mean I surrounded myself with tons and tons and tons and tons of friends. Right. So of course um, I could hide in my friends. I could find hide in all those relationships. You can hide in your children. You can hide in others. We can hide in our children. We can hide in our spouse. We can hide in our friends. We can hide in our religion. We can hide in our politics. You know, I'm a conservative. I'm a liberal. We can hide. That's all reification. It's all about this moving as far away as we can from this... Uh, you know, again, this astonishingly beautiful um, uh, title of a book, The Unbearable Likeness of Being. That's one of, that's one of those beautiful uh, 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 expressions I've ever heard. The unbearable likeness of being. So if it's true that, that, like, that beingness is so like that it's not bearable, then we have to put clothes on it, don't we? And the clothes that we put on it are all of the, the, uh, these isms, identifications, uh, all of the things that we do to, to uh, protect ourselves from just this truth of lightness. And then, of course, when we get all this crap on, on top of us, which we do, then, of course, we're just, we go around, we're just fine, except you go to Gelson's, somebody ignores you, and then suddenly <laughs> you want to kill them. So in other words, you know, it's like, <laughs> it just doesn't last. None, none, none of it lasts. I mean, you can't fool yourself. No one can really fool themselves forever. The, the truth of what we are is always there. It's basically experienced as a vague anxiety. The vague anxiety that is always there. This little anxiousness uh, that comes from this suspicion that I'm not really real. So that's all I have to say. <laughs>